All right, everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Dina and I'm the social services specialist here at ElderWorks Educational Services. Just a reminder, this event is being recorded and we will be live streaming the presentation today. Um, if you want to go back and watch the presentation, you will be able to see that on our YouTube um, channel and on our Facebook, fa Facebook page. Um, also, there were two um, videos that were sent out prior to this presentation. Both of those videos are also on our Facebook page and on YouTube. Before we get started, I'd like to explain a little bit about ElderWorks. ElderWorks is a non-for-profit organization of 501c3 um, non-for-profit. Um, our mission is to help older adults, seniors, and their families with advocacy, education, aging counseling, and um, senior living coordination. Our team takes the time to understand each one of our seniors' per personhoods and what makes them them, to understand their resources, to understand what they're looking for and what they desire. And then we're able to provide resources, support for local care, benefits, local services, housing. And really, I guess the term that serves us best is that we are senior guidance counselors to help them navigate any of those aging questions throughout their lives. Um, and that's a little bit about ElderWorks. If you have any questions throughout the presentation today, please put them in the question answer um, or in the chat box, whichever um, is easiest. Uh, most likely the chat box. Um, you will be muted during the um, presentation and we will uh, be able to um, answer questions um, when Terry is ready. And without further ado, I want to introduce Terry. She is the CEO of Personal Affairs Management and she's presenting on So You Can't Do What You Used to Do and how to organize and simplify your life. I think we can do, all could use Terry's advice today. Terry, take it away. Thanks so much. Hi everybody, happy afternoon, happy Thursday. Uh, and thanks for the intro, Deanna. Um, I am gonna just stick with exactly how you said that. So you can't do what you used to do, I like that. Okay, so I am gonna start today um, by telling you that I'm gonna do two things, two different parts. Part one is I'm just gonna give a couple of tips about how to organize your space with respect to paperwork and time and just some things that are very um, top level about paperwork and things like that. And as Deanna said, I would really encourage you to look at the uh, taped YouTube talks if you're interested in more detail about that. And then part two, I really want to kind of take a um, much wider lens view and talk about if you can't do what you used to do, what are ways that we can think about organizing our life according to new realities and our priorities. Okay, tip number one, you have too much paperwork. I would be very surprised if there's anybody here who could tell me that they Ha don't have too much paperwork and that nothing about that bothers them, based at least on the people who I work with. And that makes sense. We all keep stuff that we no longer need. When I was in college and, uh, you know, young professional, I was taught that you keep everything. You keep all of the notes from a class, you keep the syllabus, you keep all the papers you ever wrote. Uh, the same thing is true with bills and all the practical things in your life. Uh, you kept them all. And being organized meant that you had some kind of filing system where you could put things away in a sensible manner. Nowadays, things are really different because most paperwork is easily replaced. The stuff that used to be, um, you'd keep five copies because it was so important. Now, most everything is online. And um, so even if you don't go online to look at your MyChart statement or your bank statement or um, some other portal for your accountants, you may not do that. But the truth is, if that investment statement 
or bill or virtually anything else I've mentioned went missing, if you didn't keep it, you know, likelihood is you could call whatever the entity was and you could get it back. And most of the time we don't do that anyway, right? The stuff may be organized in the files, but they're files we never use or look at. Um, we also keep things too long. And that's also uh, related to the digital stuff mostly. Accountants used to routinely say that you should keep your tax returns for seven, 10 years. And now what I'm hearing is more like three to five. Obviously, that depends on your situation, how complicated your taxes are, how much backup you need. So I'm not telling you how long to keep your um, tax returns. That should be something that you talk about with your accountant. What I am saying is, again, because even the federal government has important documents like that, uh, we don't necessarily have to go back and keep them that long. And now that's true of real estate taxes and virtually anything you can think of. Um, things like older credit card and bank statements. I find that a lot of people just, you know, start a file for ComEd or for uh, Nordstrom or whatever, and then they add to it and add to it and add to it, and it gets very thick and unwieldy, and most people don't really clean it out. I typically recommend that um, you don't have to keep more than your current year's worth of stuff and maybe the year before. If you haven't figured out any use for it by then, there's probably no reason to keep it. And the reason that I'm talking about this is it's not just a matter of the physical space that paperwork takes. Sometimes that can be a problem if your closet is overflowing with boxes or your files are you know, spreading all over the place. But apart from that, the problem with having too much stuff is that you won't find it when you really need it. So those old records buried in the closet or sometimes the second bedroom or sometimes the basement or even the storage space, if you think that you're gonna find something important in there, unless it's incredibly well placed and, and labeled, if you really ever need something out of there, you're not gonna be able to find it very readily. And in my view, even more important, uh, as this picture demonstrates, your current stuff, the bills and the paperwork and everything that you're currently working with, often, if you don't manage it correctly, you wind up having piles of that. And again, you won't be able to find what it is you're looking for. And let me go into a little bit more detail about that. Um, I say in my other talk, and I think it's worth repeating, that sometimes the more afraid you are, that you're gonna lose something, the more likely it is you're gonna lose it, especially when it comes to those desktop papers. Um, a lot of people who I see, as they age, they get increasingly worried that they're gonna forget something. So what happens is you're afraid you're gonna lose a really important paper. You just came from the doctor, you take home that doctor visit summary, and it's got uh, your medications on it. It's got the next appointments you have to make. Maybe it's got notes of yours that the doctor told you. It's really important, right? So you take it and you put it on your desktop. You don't want to forget it, right? Then, you know, somebody sends you the email with the books that you have to read for the book club and you, the meeting dates, and you've got to put that in your calendar and you haven't had a chance yet. So, of course, you take that and you put it right on your desk. You don't want to lose it. You're not sure where else to put it. Sometimes, you know, important emails go there, tax forms, travel dates, things to ask your kids. There are a lot of things that we think of as important. And if you don't have a place to put it, what happens is you have a desk full of really important papers. And it may take you five minutes, half an hour that um, you don't really have to try to sort through that. And a lot of people get anxious because they're not sure they can find it. And sometimes things spread from the desk to you know, the side table and the kitchen and so on, depending on um, how people are doing with that. I also find that people uh, spend a lot of time keeping lists or notes. They're afraid that they're gonna forget stuff, which makes perfect sense, right? So you start with a list of things you really have to do this week on Monday. And then later in the day, you're in the bedroom and somebody calls you and tells you something else important or you think of something and um, you don't want to forget it. So you write it down on the sticky pad in that room because, you know, you think you'll take it into the other room later. And this goes on and on until 
a lot of times by the end of the week, what you have is, you know, sort of half lists or lists with things that are crossed out. And some of the people I work with wind up with piles of lists, and then they go back and they feel like they need to recopy the lists. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a list, but what I'm saying is that the more times you repeat stuff like that or that you keep things out on the desk because you don't have a particular place to put it that you're confident about the more likely it is that you'll either lose something or forget where it is or and not be able to find it so again i've got a lot more detail in the other um, presentation but i would ask yourself when it comes to um, anything you're in doubt about do i need to keep this should i keep this or not Ask yourself, and this is true of possessions too, why exactly would I need this? What circumstance could happen where I would really look at this, need this, not be able to replace it? A lot of people, what they say is, ah, I might need this someday, or I'm just going to keep it just in case. Take a second and think, is there any circumstance where that I can think of? If there isn't, there's no reason to keep it. Again, think about whether or not it's replaceable most things are. If in doubt, something looks important, I'm not saying don't have any paperwork, but if you don't really think that you're going to need it and it is pretty replaceable, chuck it. And this is really my pet peeves. It may or may not have anything to do with you, but I find that people wind up keeping a lot of paper and stuffing their files with stuff that they just don't have to. For example, Virtually every explanation of benefits that we get from Blue Cross or Medicare or whatever else, on the back, the last page will be something that says your appeal rights. And then it's a lot of you know nonsense about, not nonsense if you have to appeal, but it's a whole lot of um, pre-written things that don't apply to that particular claim. Keep one of those in case you have to appeal and you want to refer to it. But as you're going through, every single time you get one of those, chuck it. Uh, we get those translation pages with important documents. So after every uh, investment or other document, you get those things that have the translation in Sanskrit and Urdu and whatever it's lists down to 30, 30 things, which I think is important. It's great if you speak Urdu, but assuming that English is your primary language, chuck that too. The last page of almost every investment report may not seem important, but, uh, and also the envelopes that, that these things come in. You're gonna do much better in general. If you get rid of the envelope, you take the document, you staple the document, and then you file it. You'd be surprised how much room that saves. And then with respect to the list, think about whether what you're worrying about and spending a lot of energy on is really something that's realistic. Again, you're really afraid you're going to not remember something, whether it's an appointment or something you have to talk to somebody about or whatever. So you, you keep writing it on the list. As I said before, maybe you have multiple lists. One of the things that sort of doesn't occur to people is that if they've written the same thing on the last five lists in the last couple of weeks, they're not forgetting it. They remember, right? So I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a list or that you shouldn't try to organize yourself or keep track of things, but I think that it's worthwhile to think about what is your process and is there a way to maybe make it simpler uh, or do it differently so that you're not concerned or anxious or feeling like you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So the takeaway here is if you can do some spring cleaning, get rid of the old records you're never going to need and the boxes of stuff that just takes up space. And certainly with respect to current paperwork, when you get the mail, stuff comes in, think about that you're keeping too much paper and maybe you don't have to. Then with what's left, obviously, it's helpful to create a filing system and that doesn't have to be formal or particularly fancy. It just means that it's something that you can use in a very specific way so you know where to put the doctor visit notes and you know where to put the um, book club notes and when you're ready to deal with those things, you're confident that you can find it so you don't have to leave it out where um, you may not be able to. Okay, um, the second thing I'm gonna talk about just as a tip is just like you keep too much paper, you answer too many phone calls. And this is something that is sometimes um, counterintuitive, but I wanna go through it anyway. 
So what happens with a lot of people I work with is that the phone controls them rather than the other way around. The phone rings, whether it's your cell phone or your home phone, or sometimes both. And if you don't have it right there, you run to go get it. You always pick it up because you don't know who it could be. Even if you see the caller ID, you're not sure. And you pick it up and you get distracted from whatever it was that you were doing before. Might have been something pleasant, might have been something necessary, but whatever it is, you're no longer doing that. And even if you try not to be distracted, even if you say, oh, Phyllis, listen, I, I know, thanks. I'm glad you called, but I'm doing something. Could I possibly call you later? And she says, well, sure, but I just want to talk to you about the bridge game. So it's really important. Give me a call back. And you say, oh, yeah, I need to talk to you, too, because I'm not sure that I can host it next week. And she says, really, why? And before you know it, you're in a conversation that maybe takes five minutes or maybe it takes 20 minutes and you're not doing what you wanted to be doing at that time. Sometimes it's very pleasant. You want to talk or schmooze for half an hour, fine, but you're doing it at a time that you didn't plan to do it. You're not the one saying, this is who I want to talk to, and this is when I want to talk to them. And a, that may not seem like a big deal. Philosophically, it isn't. But the women, particularly women, but the people I work with really have a hard time not answering the phone in the moment. And I find that that often disrupts their whole day. They don't get done what they meant to get done. I know still, as the little guy who's so freaked out in the corner of the slide shows, it's counterintuitive. You don't want to miss an important call, whether it's you know from your doctor or to your kids or the repair person or whatever. And I think that a lot of this is generational. It, you know, phones have changed and everybody knows that, but they still react emotionally in a particular way. Um, the oldest generation, like my mom, um, you know, had party lines, right? But certainly no answering machines. So if the phone rang and you didn't run over to get it, you had no idea whether it was important or not or who called. So everybody had to go get it. You leave the house somebody important might call, you don't even know that they did call. In my generation, we started out without caller ID or call waiting or any of those ways to kind of organize ourselves. So um, I also felt more compelled to pick up the phone because I didn't know who it was, et cetera. Uh, and my kids who are millennials, don't even bother with voicemail. It's I'm already a relic. You know, if they call me and they want to talk and I'm not around, they don't leave a message. In fact, I've got to look at my phone to even see that they called. And I have no idea was it important or, you know, whatever. And if I leave them a voicemail <laughs> of any length, of any importance, you know, listen, we're planning Father's Day, and it's really important. I need you guys to be ready at noon. And also, could you pick up the brats? And by the way, grandma said, blah, 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 please do me a favor because I'm working today. Take care of that. And then my daughter calls at <laughs> six o'clock at night and says, hey, mom, what's up? And you know, none of that stuff got done because they didn't listen to the voicemail. So I just want to tell you that at least at some times when you're doing important stuff, Remember that nowadays, and I don't mean to be condescending in any way, because it's hard sometimes, but try to remember if it's important, the person will leave a message, whether it's a business entity or a relative, and you can listen to those messages every hour if you want to, if it makes you insecure to not see who's called. But if you start to control your day at least sometimes when it's important that you not be distracted, you'll be surprised at how much time that saves you. And you can still make the phone calls, but at a time when it's good for you. And if you're worried that people will worry about you, um, you can actually just tell your family and friends, listen, I may not pick up as often or as quickly as I have been. Don't worry. It just means I'm organizing my day. If I see it's you, I'll try to call back. So the takeaway here is at least sometimes, at least when you're not expecting the repairman to schedule with you this minute or whatever, when you have times when nothing particular is going on, but you need to get stuff done, you decide when it's convenient to return the phone calls. Maybe it's three to four every afternoon, or maybe it depends on the day, but you try to control when 
you're talking to people. Okay, so now I wanna move to um, part two of talking about this, which is how do you organize your life? Why is it, if you can't do what you used to be able to do, how do you adjust to that? A lot of obvious things about aging, and they are obvious, but I'm gonna go over them a little bit for reasons that I will explain. But the idea is how to work with those realities rather than against them. Okay, so first thing, as the title of this place says, you can't do what you used to be able to do. It's a, a truism, but it's as you age, it is true. By definition, when we age, we face new challenges and exactly how hard those are or when they come or what they are. Some people are very lucky and some people aren't. Um, but things happen. Sometimes it's physical stuff. Sometimes we get a chronic illness or um, maybe a, an acute illness that we have to manage. Sometimes we're basically pretty healthy, but you know the hands hurt from arthritis and it's really hard to do stuff, at least at certain times of the day, or your back hurts. And there's a lot of fatigue that comes with aging. You just can't run around and do the stuff that you used to do in the same manner. And sometimes your schedule is also not predictable. Sometimes you don't know when your back is suddenly going to really hit you. And even if you're perfectly healthy and very active and that's terrific, you still, you know, maybe you're concerned about falling. Um, you know, you can't just like run to get something and, you know, in and out of 10 stores at a time, right? Again, obvious, our cognitive abilities, our executive function diminishes over time, not in a straight line and not necessarily in a, a, a way that's really horrible. I think of my brain as kind of like an overstuffed closet. You know, I, I can't find things sometimes. I can't find names or words or whatever. And a lot of the stuff that I do remember is from a long time ago. It's not necessarily who I met the other day and everything is wrinkled. Um, a lot of times as we age, almost all the time, we're going to have our circumstances change repeatedly over time. Maybe your spouse is ill and you're spending a lot more time caretaking or taking him or her to the doctor. Um, it's become kind of a part-time job or sometimes a full-time job. And you know that changes everything about when you can get out, what you can do, et cetera. Um, often we face widowhood um, or widowerhood, the spouse dies. And that not only brings up a whole bunch of grief, obviously, but it also means that th what we have to do, maybe where we live, a whole lot of aspects of our life change with that event. Maybe you're thinking about downsizing or um, moving, you move to independent living or even assisted living. Maybe you're ill enough that you require some services or a caretaker. By definition, I don't mean to sound like every change is negative, but by definition, things are going to be changing. And at the same time that things are changing, for the most part, as we get older, everything takes more time, right? The healthiest of people still have to see doctors probably more often than they used to. Maybe you're doing the caregiving I'm talking about, but certainly with respect to health, there's almost always kind of a stepped up stuff that we have to do. Uh, a lot of times we have new responsibilities and that comes with those changes we were talking about. Um, I work with a whole lot of uh, widows who were, are really smart and took care of a whole bunch of stuff, whether it's, you know, whatever it happens to be, but now their spouse dies and they're responsible for taking over a whole bunch of stuff that they've never had to do before. Their marriages may or may not have been traditional in a lot of ways, but I do find very often for uh, women in their 70s, 80s, 90s, what happens is their husband took care of the investments, dealt with the taxes and the accountant, um, pretty much all the paperwork. And sometimes the smartest of women wind up in a situation where they're not on the credit cards or they are, but they don't know how to deal with the investment people or they don't never really tried to gather taxes before. 
And they're smart enough to figure it out, but it's overwhelming because they've got new responsibilities. Obviously, there are a lot of new systems in, you know, it's kind of a truism that you don't get customer service anymore. And I used to kind of scoff at that, but I don't really because, you know, nowadays you call whatever, AT&T or um, pretty much any entity, even your doctor. And uh, <laughs> the phone, uh, the answer and the first thing you hear is, please listen to these seven choices because our menu has changed, even though it never changes. And then you hear some music for a while. And then uh, finally, you get a message that says, would you like us to call you back in two hours at a time when obviously it's very inconvenient. Um, with all of the tech stuff, a lot of times um, people tell me, I don't understand. There's all this stuff that's supposed to be convenient, but it takes a hell of a lot longer than it used to when I just sat down and wrote checks. And then finally, um, no one taught the tech. Tech is always changing. Even if it's a new um, upgrade on an iPhone, it may not seem like much, but all of a sudden the stuff looks different. People who are on this are always already using Zoom and I assume are pretty proficient with tech, but it does change all the time. And the fact that we all weren't ever given any kind of education or lessons about this can make it difficult. I. I, I liken it to, you know, having to learn a new language without anybody translating for you or teaching you. And, you know, you have to go to Spain and you have to speak in Spanish, but you didn't take any lessons. And so you have to sort of pick it up as you go along. And now all of a sudden you got to order groceries that way and do a whole bunch of other things. So even if you're really proficient at tech and that's fabulous if you are, the fact that you haven't learned it as you go in any sort of formal manner, I think makes that at least take a lot more time and be aggravating. Hold on. Okay, so I've now gone through a whole bunch of stuff that most people think are obvious. You know, we all, we all know that seniors can't do what they used to and um, things have to change and so on. So Captain Obvious. Um, the reason that I spent some time going through this though is that even though all this stuff is obvious, a lot of seniors think that they should be able to do more. A lot of times I talk to people and they say, I'm so frustrated, you know, I'm embarrassed. I, I can't figure out why stuff is taking me so long. A lot of times when I um, work with somebody, the first thing they say is, I'm telling you, I used to be so organized. I used to have nothing on my desk at the end of the day. I knew where everything was. I don't understand why I don't anymore. Um, I don't understand why I can't get more done. I put Friday aside and I was absolutely going to do X, Y, or Z. But then I got some phone calls and some other stuff happened and um, I, I got nothing done. Or even sometimes I'm such an idiot. I just can't keep up. I can't deal with this tech. I don't know how to get into my bank account, et cetera. So even though things are obvious, I find a lot of times that what you know in your head is different from the emotions around that. And when your expectations of yourself don't equal the reality in terms of what you can do or want to do, it's impossible to organize your life effectively. Things are consistently going to take longer. They're going to be less predictable. And there's more capacity for becoming disappointed or frustrated or um, just not being in control of your schedule or life. Uh, so the first step, as far as I'm concerned, is acceptance. And I'm not really talking about you know, a big psychological um, approach. What I'm saying is really kind of thinking through very carefully what your life is, what you can do, what you want to do, et cetera. And I'll go through more details about that in a couple of minutes. So first of all, <coughs> excuse me, for anybody who feels bad sometimes, one sec. For the people that feel bad, that they can't do certain things, not because they miss them, but because in some way they feel like they're not measuring up, accepting that this isn't you, you're not doing anything wrong. This is sort of inherent in life and getting older is helpful. 
<laughs> I cough more than I used to. Hold on a sec. Um, there's a difference between knowing and accepting. A lot of the obvious stuff I pointed out about difficulties and transitions that we have with aging, we know them, they're obvious. There's a difference between that and saying, okay, though, when I really think about that, how is that affecting me very specifically? It's not that I'm just talking to my friend about, oh my God, we're just talking all the time about medical stuff, but actually thinking, how much time do I spend on medical stuff? Let me accept where I am right now and think a lot about that before I try to decide what I need to do or how to organize that. I also suggest that you get brutally realistic with yourself. Uh, you know, we all lie to ourselves in one way or another, or we're, we're sort of subconsciously not wanting to give up independence or admit that there are things that, you know, we're not so good at anymore. Um, if you start by saying to your daughter, uh, you know what, I don't, don't take over the bills. I can do it. I'm going to get to it, whatever the it is. Or, you know what, I can't decide about whether or not I should go to independent living or um, assisted living. I feel too sick. I just, I got to wait until I feel better and then I'll handle that big decision. You got to be brutally honest with yourself, I think. Um, if you haven't gotten to whatever it is and you're telling yourself you're going to, but you haven't gotten to it in three, four months, you're not going to get to it. It's not something that you're going to be able to do unless you sort of change your approach. If you haven't felt better in a while, uh, and it's been a long time, odds are you may not feel better, or at least when you do is going to be unpredictable and not necessarily right away. So the point I'm making is that if you actually look at specifically and then accept where you are and where you want to be and what that difference is, then you can reprioritize and you can reorganize your life in a way that feels better to you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about four steps that I think of when I think about how to do that. How do you reprioritize and organize? The first is, I've sort of touched on it, to be deliberate and realistic. The second is to decide what you shouldn't be doing, then decide what you do wanna do, and then finally decide when to do things. Okay, number one, be deliberate and realistic. You need to make a time with yourself, a date with yourself to actually sit and think about all this stuff. You know, it's um, people often say, you know, I'm going to meditate or I'm going to do X, Y, or Z for themselves. And that's the last thing they do or they don't ever do it. If you don't sit down and make some notes and think about the kinds of stuff that may be affecting you in terms of how long things take and so on. It's not gonna really get ingrained. It's not gonna be something you accept or are able to change in a really specific way. So put down a time for you to think about this, whether it's an hour a week or Friday mornings or whatever, and start using that as an important time to plan your life. It may take more time at the beginning and maybe you wanna check in with yourself every a week or two for a half an hour. But when you actually take time to deliberately think about your life, you'll find that you get further than when you're always thinking about it the way a lot of us are. And then next, be realistic. Um, how much net time do you have in a day? And when I say net time, what I mean is most of us start thinking about the day as, you know, nine to five, right? Um, except that with illness, with fatigue, uh, with things taking longer. A lot of times for a lot of people, it's not nine to five. It's 11th, 10.30 is, you know, when they feel like they're really up and around and going, they sat on the, they did whatever they had to do, but they're not usually really going until 10.30. And by three o'clock, they're really tired. They need to take a nap or whatever. They just, they're, they need to take a break. So if your net time is 10.30 to three or four, be realistic about that and start looking at your day that way. Figure out how long things really take. Um, I know a lot of people who have spent their entire life, uh, women saying, you know, I'll be ready in half an hour, um, or men for that matter. 
and they've spent their whole life getting ready in half an hour. And now actually really it's taking more like an hour, at least if they do their hair, because they're moving slowly, they're not sure exactly, whatever it happens to be, it takes longer. So pay attention to that and think about what your timing really looks like. So you're not running late or being frustrated. Think about what can you really do in a day? You know, we used to be able to maybe um, do five errands in an afternoon. Maybe now you can do two or three. And then finally, this could be a, a whole talk all by itself, but what things, no matter how independent you wanna be, no matter how strong you wanna be, what things are really hard to do now um, without help? What things might you need help with, whether it's your kids or whether it's a housekeeper or a caretaker or an organizer or whatever, what things um, are not happening because you really do need to acknowledge that you need help with it. Second, um, decide what not to do. And here are my suggestions on that. If you wanna make more time in your life and have it be simpler and more organized, you gotta get rid of some stuff. The first is, tasks that you mean to do, but you never do, right? You know, um, you me, you've got a pile of magazines and, um, you know, you want to read that article from AARP uh, and you want to take a look at the food and wine because you like that recipe and on and on and on your fraternity uh, newsletter, but you don't get to it. And so you wind up with this big pile of stuff in the corner. And every time you pass it, you feel guilty and you mean to do it, but it's never, it's never gonna happen. Chuck the pile, just get rid of it. If you haven't read something in a month, if it's important, you can look it up, right? Maybe there's drawers full of old greeting cards, whatever is at the bottom of your list or you keep meaning to do, but you never do. And meanwhile, it's not really hurting your life in any way. Stop putting it on the list, just get rid of it. Um, this again could be an hour, but think about whether there are any tasks that you can eliminate because really you're only doing it to please somebody else. Um, and the example that I'm using is, you know, maybe you love to play, play bridge, but you've been rotating and hosting the bridge game. And now that takes a lot of effort, you know, by the time you set up your house and get some snacks and send out the invitations and all that sort of stuff, it's, you know, that's a, that's a couple of days and you don't wanna spend that time anymore. Think about who are you really doing that for? And is it something that maybe if you stopped, they would understand? Or maybe even if they don't understand, you wanna to try to get rid of that anyway. And then finally, what I call um, high effort, low yield tasks. Here's the example. I think everybody I talk to is always frustrated about their cell phone bills, their cable bills, their subscriptions. It always feels like if you can just switch or you can look at the channels, you could eliminate or whatever, you can probably save some money. And I'm going to assume that that's true, you know. Um, but I would like you to think about, is that important? You know, is that something that is it's definitely high effort? because It takes a lot to compare plans and really think about it and then make the phone calls and try to change it or switch carriers or whatever. But, you know, does it really change your life? you know, if you were on a fixed budget where 10, 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month even um, makes significant difference, then go ahead, do this, make it, make it happen. But if you can think to yourself, you know, I have more channels, I don't always watch HBO Max, or I don't always use this feature, or whatever, you know, but I can let 20 or 30 bucks a month go. That seems sacrilegious, but rather than keeping it on the list and feeling guilty and worrying about it, that's something I think that you can decide not to do. Uh, you know, <laughs> I talked to somebody yesterday who said, look, can you help me? I have 5,000 unread emails and, you know, my son comes over and makes fun of me. I want to get rid of them. Well, with all due deference to your son, so what? If it doesn't bother you that you have 5,000 emails, take it off the list. Don't worry about it. Decide not to do it. Then the important thing is you decide what to do. Um, a lot of times people confuse your priorities with your list, right? If somebody asked me, my sister asked me, you know, well, what's important? What do you got to do this week? I'll talk about, well, I've got to finish this presentation and uh, I got to go shopping and I've got to blah, 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 blah. And I think of those as priorities. I got to get that done this week. 
priorities, especially at this stage in life, are different. Priorities are thinking about what's really important in my life at this stage. What gives me joy? What am I going to regret if I don't do? For example, almost universally, people say that time with their family and friends is the most important thing, but they don't always fulfill that in their schedule. Um, maybe the way that they want to do that has changed. Maybe much as you love your grandkids, you don't want to be babysitting them twice a week now, or you'd like to see your kids, maybe without the grandkids, um, making noise in the background. Maybe some friends uh, are people that you um, are really important to you, and others are old friends, but you don't want to devote a lot of effort. Maybe they're old friends you're not in touch with, but it would be really great if you were. Maybe you love the book, the book group, and it has more or less the same people as the movie group, but really you don't enjoy the movie group. Um, a lot of people start wanting alone time, undisturbed, just peaceful time. And some people do very intellectual things like the crossword or a book, and other people um, watch documentaries. And in a whole lot of people's case, including me, when I sit down and I just want to relax, sometimes I just want to watch dumb TV. And that's actually can be pleasurable. It's a priority. I want to make time for myself. And then, you know, people want, they feel really good when they go walking, but they don't always do it every day. Or they really want to do a couple of trips that'll take some organizing what they want to do it. Or you want to volunteer um, and do something that you feel like uh, is meaningful or any one of a number of hobbies. Sit down and think about what things do I really enjoy? And if you're perfectly aligned with that, if your schedule looks like that, that this is the stuff you do in a week and this is the stuff you spend the most time on, fine. But a lot of times that's not true. So then the last step is deciding when to do things. Schedule really deliberately, sit and schedule time on your calendar. Time to think, as I talked about before, Time um, to fulfill your priorities. See if you can put the priorities in the calendar first. If it's important to you to do something, to walk every day, to whatever, then make an appointment with yourself and consider that just as important as an appointment with somebody else. Don't drop it unless it's really an emergency. And then fit your necessary tasks, your doctor's appointments and stuff around that. Don't just scratch off the time you wanted to do something because somebody else wanted you to do something different. Eliminate distractions. We've already talked about phone calls. While you're doing stuff, just try not to do to, to hear things that are going to take you away from that. And then pace your days. Again, you may not be able to do five errands quickly in an afternoon the way you used to. Think about that. Think about what kind of rest you need and when, and then arrange your schedule around that. Um, okay, just a quick a quick uh, way that I think about it that might be helpful. Um, somebody once told me, go toward the mess. And what they explained they meant was, in all of our lives, there's stuff that's harder. There's stuff that we just never do. There's big decisions that we have to make, but we postpone, we procrastinate. It's, it's messy. It's like a garbage can, you know, in the corner of the room and it's swirling around. It often makes you anxious. And what he said was, that's exactly what you have to attack first. Go toward that mess and see if you can do something about that. And a lot of stuff will fall into place. Decisions and tasks don't get easier by thinking about them more. Once you've explored it, you know, you can think a whole lot more or, and you can take a lot more time over months. That's not going to necessarily make that decision any easier. Um, the example I give here is like, you know, if you have some tangled up jewelry or yarn, you're not going to be able to untangle that by thinking it through. You know, it's not going to be, oh, I'll take that little top of the of the ring and then I'll put it over there under here. You're going to have to really attack the mess, the hard stuff. You don't have to. It will be helpful for you if you try to do it sooner rather than later and more deliberately. Finally, um, one way to approach this is to take those messes, the hard decisions, the difficult tasks that you don't feel organized enough to do, separate them into manageable pieces. A lot of times people are considering, should I move to a senior residence? Should I downsize? Should I sell the house? That's a big one, right? And it's a hard decision to make for most people. Don't make it. 
Don't decide, don't think about all of the different considerations that might be there. Just go visit some of the senior residents that you're um, interested in. Maybe stay a couple of weeks like many places offer. Just talk to the realtor about what would really be involved in selling the house. What could I get for it? How fast? You don't have to decide or, or start working with that person. Just take on the, the, the meeting. You hate organizing your house or your desk or whatever, and it's really painful and you get anxious and you just sort of never get to it. Make a date with yourself for one hour, 20 minutes a day, one hour on Fridays, whatever it takes. And again, as we talk about maybe needing help with certain areas that we didn't need help with before, that's often tough to um, ask for and tough to think about. Don't make a decision. Just interview somebody who might be able to be helpful to you. Find out what that looks like. See how you feel about it. So you can't do what you used to do. And a lot of people find that uh, frustrating, even though it's obvious. What I'm trying to say is that do what you can and work very deliberately to make time to do what you care about. Thank you. I will be happy to take as many questions as there are. All right, everyone. If you have questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, Terry, I did come up um, with a couple of questions. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask. I know um, early in your presentation, you, you referenced those pieces of paper <laughs> of which in front of me, there are many. Uh -huh. um, how do you how do you feel about a single notebook, a journal that people go back to? Or for those that are tech savvy, maybe a, a note on their phone, because there are different apps for that. Could you speak to, to either of those and what you think of that? Sure. Um, the first thing, I don't think there's an answer for everybody. So the first thing that I would normally say is, what are you doing with those sticky notes? Do those sticky notes work? And then you get rid of them and put it on the list or get stuff done and then they're gone? Or do those sticky notes accumulate in a way where it's just not at all helpful? Obviously, I do agree, depending on um, somebody's preference, it's really great if you can stick to one pad of paper, not one in every room. And I know that's that's hard to do sometimes, depending on your physical capacity. And, and But if you can, when you're now moving into the other room, take your list with you, that can be helpful. Same thing, I agree, uh, that notes app on iPhones um, or similar things like that. If you're savvy enough to do that, that's something that you can pull out every minute, every time you think of something, because most people have their phones with them. So yeah, I think that's helpful. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came through um, the chat um, is what's the best way to manage whether you have taken your medicine? Again, this varies. How many pills do you take? How many times do you have to take that? What is your um, cognitive ability? You know, if you're forgetting, why are you forgetting? But um, depending on your situation, there are a whole lot of different ways to handle that. Uh, I have a friend who has pretty advanced Parkinson's and needs to take pills at a particular time and was really having a hard time with that. And he tried, you know, an alarmed medicine box, uh, having his daughter call and remind him. He tried a bunch of things. Um, and finally, what he settled on is every single day, he has repetitive alarms on his phone. The one thing that's always with him is his phone. And he finally formed the habit that when those alarms go off, instead of hitting snooze, he's promised himself, no, he, he's not gonna hit snooze. He's just gonna take the phone, go to the medicine, take the medicine. And then what I think is really helpful is wherever your medicine is, however you take it, different rooms, different times, have a little notebook right there. And then just write down every single day, 9 a.m. meds, check, 12 p.m., check. Um, so that when you forget, uh, and we all do, you can go back and say, oh, all right, I did that. And does that answer your question? Um, yes, but I, I was wondering if I could uh, pose some further aspects to it. You sure. see, one of the things that um, 
I've noticed about myself lately is that things that I do very often, I can't remember that I do them. For example, I leave um, my apartment, can't uh, remember if I lock the door. So I spend a lot of time going back mm -hmm. or in the morning, um, I have to take one medicine, everything else is at night. Well, all the, uh, all the night stuff is uh, by habit, but in the morning, um, I used to have a piece of paper that I would write down whether or not I would take this one medicine. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes I would take the medicine, forget to write down on the piece of paper. So then I'm uh, scratching my head. Well, gee, did I uh, take the medicine or not? Do I have to start counting the tablets in the bottle and subtracting it away from, you know, when did I get this uh, prescription filled? And it, for me, it, it just doesn't seem like a really good system that I've developed yet. Maybe it's just more uh, discipline I need on my part, but uh, it's the medicine in the morning that uh, gets me the most. I, I, I totally get that. Um, and I hear that there are a couple of different components of that. There's the planning component, you know, what system do you need to set up so that you're minimizing the chance of missing your pills? And then also the cognitive issue of if you don't remember and that system doesn't work well enough. So sometimes I think you need to try different systems, but also try a combination. So um, for example, when it comes to the medicine, um, maybe I, I, most people put the medicine, they set it up for the week or for two weeks. So it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, in those components. And what I've seen a lot is, you know, if you, if you always take them with food and it's in the dining room, that's where you keep it. But sometimes the morning meds are in the bedroom because that's where you need to take it. Um, if do you have an, a phone or something where you could set an alarm, I think you're saying yes. Yes, I got muted. Uh, the answer is yes. Okay. And what have you tried that with respect to the morning meds? Um, no, I haven't, but I could start doing that. Okay. I find that that's really helpful. And uh, especially if you put it on some kind of sound that's like loud and jarring, um, you know, most people don't want to hear that again. So I would do a combination in the morning, um, make sure that all the meds are day by day and do an alarm to remind you and um, maybe try the pad. But if you go back and you say to yourself, I don't know if I took them, they're either in that, that Monday or Monday AM or they're not. Um, with respect to other stuff, um, you know, it depends on your circumstances. Some people, if they can afford it, put uh, a system in their place uh, with um, where you can lock your doors remotely, where you can look and a camera to see uh, what, what's going on in your house. Not terribly expensive, but if you're worried, did I lock the door or did I not? You can look at that app on your phone and you'll see whether you did. And if you didn't, you can remotely lock it instead of having to go back. Thank you, good idea. Okay. Um... Somebody had asked for Terry's contact information. She has put that back in um, the chat. So you will be able to get that. Um, two questions, Terry. Um, you use the term when planning, planning your life and being able to look at this and prioritize and tasks. And if somebody spends that time to try and, and, and do that, how is best to be able to sort of put themselves in a plan or in an accountability? What does that look like? Um, are you talking more about forming the plan or finding a way to be accountable once they do that? Or a little bit? I, I think a little bit of both. Um, I was looking for more of once you've you've narrowed things down, where do you go from there? But I think I think you had talked about the prior piece of what makes, what do you need to do? So mm -hmm. you sort of went through that within your discussion, but if you get down to, these are the five tasks that, or priorities, how do you, how do you hold that accountable to manage your time? Um, I, I think the key thing 
that people don't do they they think that they're planning they're constantly you know trying to untangle the jewelry but they don't put unprotected time in their schedules where they you know every friday morning or whenever it's convenient they ask themselves all right what's going on how did i do this week did it take a little bit longer than i thought it would did i was i able to call that person if i wasn't is it because i'm anxious let me be radically honest with myself you know what's at the bottom of things that you were able to do or not did i do my priorities this week it to some extent is just forming a habit you've got to be able to sit down with yourself and look both forward and back and i think if you do that it becomes pretty obvious what's working and what isn't you know after a few weeks where you say to yourself some of the stuff that i went over how long are things taking am i doing my priorities or not did i lock the important things in or did i let those go after a few weeks of that if you just can get yourself to sit down and think of it the implementation of the plans or what you have to do where you have to go starts becoming really obvious okay um we have just a couple of minutes left. I'm checking the chat again. I don't have another question in there. Um, I know um, you had referenced technology um, in the presentation. And one of the things I wanna let everybody know is um, one of the resources that ElderWorks does um, have is we have um, tech support um, seminars. And our next one will be July 13th at 1.30. I am not sure of the topic for that one yet, but we do have that coming up. Um, and one of the great things I think about our organization and I'm so proud to be a part of is when a senior has a question, they can call us because we have resources such as Terry to say, hey, you need help with organization and getting this done you might want to reach out to Terry, but if you need help with technology, this is another avenue. Um, so that is um, something that I just took a note to make sure I told people we had that technology coming up. Um, the phone call thing, I think, is a hard piece for a lot of people um, because some people still have home phones. Um, some have cell phones, but they leave them either plugged in in the kitchen charging and different things like that. And they do feel that need to go and answer that phone. Um, how do you think you can prioritize um, whether they take that phone call or not? Do you think caller ID is, is the piece of it um, for that? Yeah, I think caller ID is helpful, but what I find is that people who are anxious about not picking up the phone, sometimes they're, they're doing it so quickly, they literally aren't looking at that. They're not picking it up, looking, and then making a deliberate decision. Oh, that's my sister or my son. I can call him back later. That's, that's okay. Or this is the doctor's office. I better pick this up. So to the extent you can get in the habit of using that caller ID, um, that's great. And sometimes it's also like a visual thing. So um, it, again, technology, home phones and cell phones, you can set them so that they ring longer before it goes to voicemail. You can get adaptive devices that will announce to you who is calling or that make it larger print. So maybe adapt some of those things so that, you know, you really can. And then again, at the end of the week, think, all right, I didn't do that. I was supposed to do that Thursday, Tuesday afternoon. Well, where did that go? And I think you'll find that a lot of it is going to phone calls, but instead of it being at a reasonable time for the reasonable length that you spent a minute and a half deciding ahead of time, actually, oh yeah, I was doing that. Oh, it is counterintuitive, but I find phone calls at the wrong time make a huge difference. Um, we don't have any final questions. Terry, do you want to give us a final thought before I close this out? Just thank you. You know, start by being as honest with yourself as you can. If you look at what you're doing, you'll figure it out. Okay. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, thank you, everyone who joined us um, today. I, uh, my final thought, I think for everyone is that, you know, take that time and be a little bit more organized. 
Um, but I think be kind to yourself and know that there are resources out there um, that will help you answer a question or if you have um, a project that you need done and maybe cannot do it or you need support at home, there are organizations out there um, such as Terry's uh, or you can call Elder Works and we'd be more than happy to help you. Thank you everybody and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.